Good evening and welcome to the March 19, 2020 emergency call meeting of the Muskogee City Council. Roll call, please. Mayor Janie Boydston. Here. Deputy Mayor Wayne Johnson. Here. Evelyn Hibbs. Here. Stephanie Morgan. Here. Marlon Coleman. Here. Ivory Van. Here. Derek Reed. Here. Alex Reynolds. Here. Jamie Stout. Here. You, I guess you can tell that we're spread out according to the CDC guidelines. Uh, we're trying to do everything the best we know how or how we learn how. Item one, please. Receive report on Muskogee's current status of, of preparedness and response to the COVID-19 pandemic national emergency declaration and take other necessary action. Mr. Miller. Hello, Mayor. Thank you for joining us on short notice. And Mayor, thank you for calling this meeting. I think it's very important. Um, the first thing, first thing that I want to do is just talk a little bit about an overview, and then we'll talk about specifics. Um, the, uh, we're on the phone at least twice a day with the county health department as a liaison for them to help let us know uh, what they think is going on in our community, and what they know, and, and allowing us to be as prepared as possible. Um, you probably already know that Oklahoma's experienced the first death from COVID-19, uh, and there are 44 reported cases now, including two under the age of five. Um, what the county health department is telling us, is what we're really experiencing here is a failure of testing. They don't have the tests here in the county. They don't have the tests at the state level that we need. And they thought, they've been told, telling us all week, well, we'll have, we'll have tests early this next week. So there are very few tests in Muskogee and Muskogee County. Uh, and what they have, they can only use in very limited cases. Uh, and what they do test is a backlog at the state to verify whether it's a positive test or not. And so what they described to us today was the, cap the capability of testing is horrible. So we know that. And we have to understand that about our community. And so what we know that means is that we probably do have cases in Muskogee. We know that if there were tests going on, that it's likely that we would know that the people in our community have that. Uh, that's why I'm glad that the mayor's called this emergency meeting. Um, the, uh, we have several topics that we're gonna cover in relation to this, uh, but I wanted to start there, and then as we, we uh, address those and then let you guys ask questions, we'll provide the answers, um, and then we will uh, consider the next agenda item about an emergency, uh, as many other communities have done. Uh, right now, I'm going to turn it over to our emergency uh, manager, uh, Tyler Evans. He'll give us a little bit further update about what's going on uh, here in Muskogee. Ms. Mayor, members of council. Uh, to give you guys an update, like Mr. Manager said, we have a briefing every morning uh, from County Health Department. We have one in the afternoon before close of business to see any updates that are going on and that's also with any other uh, conference calls we may have with state or federal officials uh, so far uh, the county and us have been working uh, together since the start of this the city of muskogee emergency management and muskogee county emergency management uh, like sort of working together to address that um, what we've decided to do kind of like we did during the flood is we've agreed to enter into a unified command for emergency management departments and what that does is uh, we can better address this emergency by combining our resources, personnel, contacts, and information sharing to our community. Uh, between the county and us, there's three emergency management directors, a deputy director that's over there. Uh, we can share our resources that we have, our contacts we have in the community, and everything else. Uh, we're gonna start up a joint information center, kind of like we did during the flood, to put our information together. Uh, this allows both our departments to serve as a single source for valid, reliable information that we can share and educate our community with. Um, do we want to address the uh, changes to the emergency operations plan right now? Or no, wait. No. Okay. So that's what we're doing from the emergency management uh, standpoint is we're working eight hours a day on this. Uh, you know, probably get 20 or 30 different emails a day, if not more, keeping us up to date on COVID-19 and what's affecting our community. As of right now, we don't have any positive cases of COVID-19 in Muskogee. Which is very good. Oklahoma County, I think, latest news they had about 18. So from Muskogee County, we still do not have a positive case here. Uh, but as I stated, we're this is an ongoing situation. It changes by the hour, and like I said, we continue to recommend the recommendations from the CDC 
the World Health Organization, obviously our president and our governor on the recommendations on uh, how to combat uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. So um, what I want to emphasize to you guys right now is that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, our water people that at the water plant, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. The people at the sewer plant, they're doing their job. Uh, our sanitation workers are doing their job. Very important in a public health crisis that that job continues. Our police officers, they're doing their job. The fire department, they're doing their job. Our friends at EMS and at the hospital, the people that work in the healthcare field, they're all doing their job right now. And I want to say our frontline employees in every department, they're doing their job. And I think I need to single out a few other people. Uh, Mr. Evans, our emergency manager, Mr. Tucker, Mr. Garvin, Ms. Tracy, they're doing their job. We are doing what we do here at the city and what you guys do as city council members is very important because you guys set the policy and the direction for the city. We take that very seriously about keeping our citizens safe. And so we appreciate what you're doing and I want you to know that we take it very seriously, uh, the, the work that you give us to do. And so uh, as I say that, I want to say what, what we're doing right now is following the guidelines uh, for the CDC, uh, the state health department, the county health department. So one of the things that there's been a lot of talk about is um, public uh, events um, in city facilities. And so as you know, and as we've talked about before, we've pretty much shut those down. Anything over 10 at a city facility, uh, we're, we're not allowing those to happen. Again, following CDC and, and state health department guidelines. This document that you have in front of you is also kind of a hot topic uh, um, around Oklahoma and around the country. What should restaurants and bars do? What could, should communities do in relation to their to restaurants and bars? Um, you know, people uh, places where people gather in public. And so, uh, what we have been doing and what we recommend doing is continue to follow what the health department recommends. And so. Uh, this is one of, uh, as Tyler said, we get many emails a day with information and we have to try and sort through them and what is important and what, uh, what is of value. And this is one from the health department I want you guys to, to look at. Uh, the recommendations that we have in the declaration for emergency are similar to this. It does not, uh, the state uh, health department, the county health department is not recommending that we close bars and restaurants. It's not recommending that we close down businesses at this time. Um, and they have recommendations for how businesses should conduct themselves that are in, uh, that, are in that industry. Uh, you can read those for yourselves, but uh, what I hear, a lot of uh, the restaurants are already doing these sorts of things, removing condiments from the tables, uh, limiting dine-in options so the, the capacity of, of the dining rooms is, is smaller so people can, can uh, spread out like we're doing here tonight. Um, you know, increased uh, to-go options. And so, these are the, the kinds of things that we want to say. People have asked a lot. Are you going to shut down all the bars and restaurants? Are you going to close businesses X, Y, and Z? Um, we don't feel that that's uh, within our scope of authority or that's been recommended uh, by the health department. And uh, so our, uh, our guidelines to this point have been to follow what, uh, what the CDC and the health department have outlined. And so our recommendations moving forward are to continue doing that. And that's part of what may be in the in the uh, draft emergency declaration. Um, I'll pause there. I know it's been a hot topic related to, to, to bars and restaurants. If you guys have questions related to that, we can address those now. We certainly have other topics that we'd like to address too, so. What if we So there is, uh, there's not enforcement at this time because these are recommendations from the health department. So what we generally, uh, what I generally recommend is we want to be safe as a community. We want to be kind to our neighbors. We want to be helpful to our neighbors and it spreads, uh, uh, the disease spreads when we're in close contact with each other. And so if people, uh, if businesses are doing business in a way that you don't think is safe, then you may not want to patronize that business. If they are, however, however business is acting, that you react accordingly to the CDC guidelines in your own evaluation of that situation. There's not a, uh, there's not a regulation to be enforced from the health department, um, just recommendations at this time. So 
I want to talk a little bit more, uh, and we can take questions on the, those, these subjects as we go along. I want to talk a little bit more about um, what we're doing as a city as well. Uh, we've got a news section on our website. We're updating it um, daily uh, and sometimes multiple times a day, also through Facebook and YouTube. Um, information that we have that we're trying to distribute. So if anybody wants to know what's going on, what is the city doing, what does the city know, um, certainly you, you have the, the, uh, the national CDC websites to go to. You have the state department websites and then go to our city website um, and you can see the latest and if you go to our news section you'll see all the ones that we've done in the last few days relating to this. So I want to make sure everybody knows that is a resource that's available to you. Um, we, uh, uh, because of those CDC guidelines, we've shut down Swim and Fitness Center, the Senior Center, uh, and a lot of other things uh, that we've already emailed and, and had done news releases about, and I won't waste your time going over all those. But again, what the CDC guidelines are, that's what we're following right now, and that's our intention to follow in the future. Uh, we're also changing the way we do business in some of uh, our departments, and so I want to ask our municipal judge to come forward and, and talk a little bit about um, how municipal court is going to proceed in the in the short term. Judge Smith. Thank you. So we've been evaluating every day, just kind of seeing how things are going, whether or not we need to make any changes in our court. We've made a few changes as we've gone along, but as of today, I've written an order that I plan on signing tonight. So I want to read it all to you guys, get your input, see if you have any questions about any of it. The orders will suspend all dockets, including, including juvenile, for the weeks of March 23rd, March 30th, and April 6th. Cases set on suspended dockets will be set for the same day, same time, exactly two weeks later, which works really well with our software. Only court personnel and law enforcement are going to enter the courtroom until further order. No defendants housed in the Muskogee County Jail should be brought to the courtroom unless specifically ordered by the judge. All in-custody arraignments will be done via video conferencing or other technologies. And we've already spoken with the jail and how we can accomplish that. No warrants will be issued by the court for failure to appear until further order of the court. The court clerk remains open and staff will be available via telephone or in person. And the court clerk has authority to take pleas and enter into payment plans as necessary. The court will be this order will be vacated or amended by this court no later than April 10th. So that's our plan at this time. We obviously have a lot of people that come in our courtroom next week. I think we have like 230 cases, and that doesn't include juveniles, which I think we had 70. So that's about 300 people that we would have in and out of that courtroom in five days. So we're taking our precautions and limiting all the contact that we have. And if anybody has any questions or recommendations, I welcome them. Sounds like a good plan, Judge Smith. Okay. Thank you. I'll sign this order tonight then. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, also, uh, we have um, some new uh, protocols the police department is undertaking as they interact with the public, and I'll ask uh, Chief Teehe to come forward and talk to you guys a little bit about that. Good evening. Kind of along the same lines as what uh, everything else is. It's kind of something that we're, we may change on a, on a daily basis depending on what comes out. but. For the most part, we begin on uh, March the 3rd having meetings with other first responders, kind of getting our everything together, kind of ideas about equipment, uh, things that we need. Uh, we have, since that time, we've uh, acquired enough N95 masks to take care of all of our police officers. We're still waiting on some other equipment that the health department has told us that they're in the process of getting, but we haven't got that yet, but we're still working on that. Uh, we put information out earlier with regards to how we're doing business, uh, and this come from recommendations from uh, several different agencies, IACP, different places across the country, having to do with how we do reports. Uh, if it's a report that we can take over the phone, we won't go to the house. Um, if they just absolutely demand to see a police officer, then we'll show up, but at the same time, uh, our dispatchers have begun doing screenings where as they uh, ask, have you had any outside travel, anything like that? And then if you answer yes to that, then they'll go from there and start trying to find out where it is, have you been sick, any of those type of things. to kind of give us an idea what we're dealing with before we get there. Uh, if it is something we need to use the mask, gloves, that type of stuff, then we can do that uh, if possible. Obviously in law enforcement, we don't always get that opportunity. 
Uh, the other thing that we've done is um, we've suspended uh, arresting for municipal warrants. Uh, if we have run across somebody that has a city warrant, we'll just tell them, come in, take care of that. Um, and that has to do with some jail procedures and some different things that could cause other issues. Um, just different processes that we're doing throughout the police department. We'll try to keep a distance uh, like whatever what we're here and doing here tonight. We'll try to do that as much as possible, but obviously that's not always possible in law enforcement. Um, <clears throat> other than that, um, we're setting our court dates out. I know court has been canceled, as the judge has said. We're also setting our court dates out on citations that are issued for 45 days plus. Uh, so just to get that out there, try to get outside that window. Hopefully there'll be... Uh, We'll be further along in the process uh, on the downhill side that far out. Um, other than that, we're just, uh, like I said, we, we keep up with things going on on a daily basis with uh, press conferences and uh, phone conferences, and we'll just change as needed uh, to with regards to the safety of the city and the uh, best health of our police officers. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Sounds like you've got it under control the best you can. So as an example of uh, what we've got going on, Chief Tee was supposed to be skiing today. <laughs> but there's a lot of there's more important things going on. And so um, we've got a lot of dedicated employees that, that I really and truly appreciate it. Um, speaking of employees, we're not just uh, we're, we're a government that, that helps the community, but we're also an employer. So I want to give you an update about what we're doing with our employees uh, as it relates to this disease. Uh, a new federal law uh, passed just yesterday um, adds additional sick leave, and so we're working on implementing that law within our policy. We sent out an expanded, uh, more liberalized leave policy more than a week ago. You guys have a copy of that. Um, so we're just going to fold those things in, obviously, to follow the federal law. Um, we have uh, a work-from-home policy in, uh, that, that is in place, and we're implementing that that as we can. There's a lot of jobs that obviously we can't work from home, but if there's those opportunities, we're going to, to do that, uh, again, to try and flatten the curve, as people have said, to lower interaction. Um, and we also have uh, put together uh, essential employee lists or really job duties and job tasks. So um, this is more of a preparation for in the future if we have limited workforce, what do we absolutely have to do? What are, what are things that we don't have to do as much? Um, and so we see that some even now with, with some of our uh, parks and recreation areas being closed. You know, uh, what, can, what can those employees do uh, in other areas to help, it, to help the city? Um, and if there are times where we're shorthanded in some, uh, some other area due to illness, people in those areas may be able to help out. So those are, uh, those are all things that we're working on. Um, three other things uh, we want to talk about just briefly um, and allow you guys to, to at least think about, possibly discuss it if you care to. Um, the uh, two new laws passed yesterday, <laughs> or a, a new law and a new resolution, I guess, from the election board allowing uh, a change to uh, election days. We have a municipal election coming up uh, on April 7th. We're going to have an agenda item on for Monday. To, for you guys to discuss that. And uh, the uh, idea is that the, the election, state election board allows us uh, to decide as a community whether we want to move that election to June 30th uh, or keep it on the same day. Um, they said, if you move it, you're still paying for the April election, <laughs> but, uh, but you can also have it on, on June 30th. So uh, I'll pause there if there's any discussion we want to have about that tonight. Again, we can't take action on it, but we can discuss it, and we'll definitely have it on the agenda for Monday. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, the, an important thing, we've talked about social distancing. On uh, the Monday meeting, we have uh, the state law that passed yesterday um, allowed for remote participation in open meetings, which has been very hard to do in the past. So we're going to ask um, uh, each of you uh, to have the opportunity, whether you'd like to participate remotely via phone on Monday's meeting or not. Part of the, uh, um, part of the rules for that are that we have to post on the agenda who's going to physically be here and who's not. So uh, we'd like to, uh, I'd like to actually, um, <coughs> 
slow, slow myself down a little bit and let, let you have um, your expert, Mr. Tucker, come forward if he would, if he would and explain uh, the, the Open Meeting Act rules and he may want to explain the election a little bit further as well. And after we've had that discussion, um, we'll have uh, basically a sign-up sheet or we can raise hands, however we'd like to do that, indicate how you'd prefer to, um, to attend the Monday meeting. Good afternoon. Uh, covering uh, Senate Bill 661 first, which is the amendments to the Open Meeting Act. As you all may remember, during some of my open meeting training, uh, there has always been a provision in the law which has allowed for video conferencing. However, it has been very restricted. So under prior law, video conferencing was allowed, but those members who wish to appear via video conference had to appear in a location that was in the locale where they were elected, so it would have to be in Muskogee. They had to uh, identify the location from where they would be appearing, as well as a <coughs> phone number and address uh, of that location also posting a copy of the meeting notice at that location and also allowing entry of the public into that location. So it made it very difficult to utilize the video conference option for issues that came up such as with this pandemic because many times you expect if a council member wants to appear remotely for a meeting they're going to do so because of either self-quarantine isolation or because they just are concerned about getting out in public well that kind of goes away when you've got to post a meeting on your uh, meeting notice on your front door and let the members come in so that was an unworkable solution now fortunately the legislature took action a very quick action to put a band-aid on uh, this provision within the Open Meeting Act. So as a temporary fix, uh, Senate Bill 661 uh, allowed certain amendments to the act, which would allow not only video conferencing without those arduous requirements, but also telephonic conferences. So in that, uh, members can call in to participate in the meeting. Uh, the location does not have to be identified. The location um, where the member is calling in from does not have to be open to the public. It's very simplified. So what happens now is you make the election whether or not you want to appear via telephone or in person or video conference. Um, for purposes of this discussion, we'll talk about teleconferencing because I'm not sure we've got our video conferencing capabilities up just yet. So uh, for purposes of that, you make the election whether you want to appear uh, via telephone or in person. Uh, the agenda that we put out will reflect that choice. So if uh, a council member says they want to appear by telephone, their name will appear on the uh, agenda and an indication that they will be uh, appearing via phone. Um, then once the meeting occurs, uh, there has to be an option where uh, the members can hear each other, the members of the public can hear them, and they can hear the members of the, and the member can hear the uh, folks from the public who want to speak. Um, the uh, ability of the public to participate is not affected. Uh, same rules apply. Uh, so under our rules, if a citizen wants to speak uh, during a telephonic meeting, uh, they would simply need to uh, sign up or call in uh, at least 15 minutes prior to the beginning of the meeting, and then they would be permitted to participate in that regard. Um, and so it makes it very, very easy to conduct business uh, in the course of uh, an event like the COVID-19 pandemic that's occurring. Uh, it will allow us to uh, maintain our distance distance and yet still conduct the business of the city. And so why I say this is a band-aid is because it is a temporary fix. And so these provisions within the Open Meeting Act, which are allowing these telephonic um, meetings, expire on November 15th or when the governor declares that the emergency is over. And so it is a very short window when we can do that. And then once that, uh, once that window uh, ends, then uh, unless the legislature takes further action, we'll go back to the, the way that it was. And so uh, I think Mr. Miller had indicated that we will send a sign-up sheet as to who indicates how they want to appear. Uh, because not only did the agenda have to indicate who's going to appear uh, via telephone, it has to indicate whether it's going to be via telephone or whether it's going to be video conference. And as I said, we don't have video conference capabilities as of yet, but we're working on it and so it may uh, be an option in the future. Um, now the uh, 
challenge with that is if you make an indication that you will appear in person, then you can't later appear via telephone on that same meeting. But if you indicate that you want to appear via telephone, but for some reason you're out of quarantine or um, you know the, the circumstances which caused you to want to appear via telephone have changed, you can certainly appear in person, in physical, in physical presence uh, in that regard. So you can do one, just not the other. And so there, is, there has been given a lot of freedom uh, to the public bodies to be able to con conduct business. Um, so that's the uh, Open Meeting <coughs> Act revisions, which are uh, embodied in uh, Senate Bill 661. So we thank the legislature and the governor for acting so quickly on that to allow us and cities like us to be able to conduct business um, in as efficient means as possible, limiting our, limiting our exposure. Um, moving on to the uh, election order, the uh, Secretary of the Election Board, as Mr. Miller mentioned, um, filed a declaration of election emergency, um, which permitted cities who had cities, towns, and other jurisdictions, such as school districts, the opportunity to change their election uh, from April 7th to the next available election date, which is June 30th. And so uh, there are some requirements uh, that need to be met, such as a resolution making that change, uh, meaning that there must be a resolution canceling the election, rescheduling it for June, June 30th, uh, and that must be passed and filed by uh, the 30th of this month. And so that doesn't give the council much time to make a decision. And so we have an agenda item set up for Monday where uh, we will ask you to make the call on whether you want to pass that election to from uh, uh, April 7th to June 30th. Uh, also, as a reminder, uh, if that runoff uh, mayoral election is moved to June 30th, that will also be the same date that we have planned for the uh, initiative petition uh, that did garner enough signatures. Uh, however, we do have to pass two separate resolutions. So the resolution for Monday night uh, that we will be discussing will only be related to the runoff election. Um, the following council meeting, we will put an agenda item on to talk about the um, uh, calling for the election related to the initiative petition. Um, I talked with uh, Kelly Beach, the secretary of the county election board today, and he asked for efficiency and so that they could be sure and keep uh, the issues separate. They wanted two different resolutions uh, submitted separately rather than combined. So uh, we will certainly comply with their request and do that. So uh, any questions regarding those two items? Mr. Tucker, yes, sir. It, it may not be a bad idea to suggest to members of the council that they may want to sign up to do teleconferencing, whether they plan to teleconference or not, for the simple fact if anyone were to become ill, at least they have the option to be at home to participate, whereas you can't just decide the day of that I can't come out because I'm sick, so I want to participate. So it may be a good idea for people to just sign in advance whether they plan to be here or not. And that's a really good point, Counselor, um, particularly when facts are changing every time and, or every day, and it looks like the uh, number of cases is um, exponentially increasing. And so uh, some of us may not know someone who uh, has tested positive for COVID-19, but in a couple of days, we may know someone. And so uh, that's how... Uh, it works, and so I think that is a good point. And so, if there is any any interest at all in appearing via uh, telephone, then I would urge you to sign up on the form that Mr. Miller is uh, passing around. Uh, if you indicate that you want to appear via phone, but then the day of the meeting you decide you were able to appear, you can certainly, as Councillor Coleman pointed out, appear in person, but the converse is not true. So if you've indicated you'll be here in person, you can't then on the date of the meeting change your mind. And now the sign-up sheet that we're talking about is meeting specific. And so if you indicate that for Monday's meeting you wanna be here by telephone uh, and then you know, on the next meeting, Tammy, what's the date of the next meeting? The second? <coughs> yes, I Okay, that's so then on April 2nd, you decide, well, no, I didn't like being via telephone, I wanna be there in person. You can change that per meeting. So there's not, you don't make an election once and are stuck with it, it's, it's each meeting you can make that election. Any other questions?
You're not on yet, I don't think. Yes. However, because that election in June is also a state primary, the cost is cheaper than it is when we're standalone. Um, there is a Hillboard, uh, excuse me, Hilldale School District uh, election. Uh, they are also, according to the election board, having a special meeting to determine whether or not they're going to move that one as well. Uh, but as of today, I don't know whether they've had that meeting. Um, someone else may know. It's not until Tuesday. Tuesday, okay. Right. Absolutely. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. You're welcome. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Miller. You'll hear you'll hear from me again on the uh, uh, emergency declaration when we talk about the uh, continuity of government. Did you? Yes. Ms. Miller, may we recognize? Yes. I wonder if you uh, have more people want to come up here and instead of doing this teleconference. What do you do in a situation like that? I mean, the sign up. The citizens the that cit come to speak. No, I'm talking about the council, but people up here now. Like yeah, we're no. sitting up here now. We want to come up here live like we are now. Uh -huh. You have more people want to come up here and do that. How do you handle that? It wouldn't be any different. I mean, you'd still be permitted to do that. Uh, the, the, uh, the meeting will not only be telephonically. It'll still be in this room because staff, we will be here, even if everyone's on the phone. So people can still come in the audience. Um, it'll still be televised. Um, you may see empty seats, but the audio will be available. Is that kind of what you're asking? In a way, yeah. I mean, okay. I, like I said, I know I don't want to be videoed. I want to come. Up, I'm gonna, I want to come up here. And I was just saying, if I had more, I mean, more people, councilmen or women want to come up here, you know, how would we handle that? I mean, you said everybody's going to be in, in the same room, mm -hmm. correct? Well, except for those people who are appearing remotely. Okay. I mean, it, they can uh, they can call in from home or another location if they want to. For example, if Councilor Coleman decided that he wanted to appear via telephone, then we would have a number that he could call, um, probably uh, to that telephone over there. And then, um, you know, you would still have the discussion. He would just, his chair would be vacant, but you would still hear him and he would be able to participate in the um, meeting. And so that would be the rule if nine of you decide to appear via phone or if one of you decided to be via, via phone okay but the employees don't have that option like the the police or the firemen or they have to be here in person anyway that would be up to the city manager um, they are not uh, they're not part of the quorum requirement for holding a meeting uh, for purposes of that only the elected officials matter I see. Roy, <clears throat> Roy, I guess uh, a piece of the confusion, we hear a number of 50 people gathering for meetings. We hear a number of 10 people gathering for meetings. How will, you know, those, those numbers play out in this situation? Well, it, for purpose of the Open Meeting Act, that's totally different. Okay. Um, so th what you're talking about, uh, Councilor Reed, are the recommendations from the CDC and the State Health Department. And so they've issued those recommendations as it relates to mass gatherings, and they've asked that those be limited to uh, no more than 10 people. And so since we are not mandating that, since uh, what Mr. Miller's talking about and what the emergency uh, resolution that's proposed will do is only recommend those guidelines. So I believe that um, on our uh, most recent press release that was sent out, we did ask people to, uh, if they, unless they wanted to speak or present something, to uh, appear uh, and watch it uh, live. And we also included the link uh, in that description to dissuade people from from coming up if they still wanted to know what was happening but not actually have to be here in in uh, person thank you got one more question Roy I understand on the election you know which I think is a great idea to move it to June 
<clears throat> but I still want to know, uh, like, the candidate that got elected on the council, when do we swear them in? That is something that will be decided on Monday when we uh, talk about the resolution and what we want to include in it. Okay. So um, the provision in the charter, which relates to the appointment, indicates that uh, elected officials will be appointed, I believe, the Tuesday after the general and runoff election. Now, the charter itself references a March date. But if you remember, the charter also calls for a January election and a March um, runoff. Well, the state election laws that were passed after we amended the charter took that away. And so now we have February and April elections. And so the regular seating uh, would be April 14th, and that's what was advertised uh, when we sent out the candidate packets back in November. And so um, that would certainly be staff's recommendation, simply because uh, that ensures that uh, the candidates get the full uh, amount of their term once they were elected. Um, and I know that there will be effectively a shorter term for whoever wins the mayor's spot, um, but, but that's something that couldn't be helped. In the case of the other candidate, uh, Ms. McGee, who has won, you know, it, it's one of those things that she wouldn't have any control over. And so she's already been elected. And with the runoff, there hasn't been an election yet. So. Because I just didn't think, you know, it would be fair to go all the way to June. Sure. <clears throat> you know, and, and she's already been sure. elected. You know, to me, that'd be very unfair. Well, and, and my recommendation is to, um, will be on Monday night to stick with the same uh, date of swearing in for new council members. In this case, we only have one of April 14th. So. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> One other thing that we've gotten a lot of questions about relates to uh, our public utilities, uh, sp specifically our water service. We know that water is uh, very essential in a public health crisis, so um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not we should be cutting off service during this time. I think staff's recommendation is that we don't cut off service uh, in the future um, as we see the economic impact coming and the, the health uh, being affected. So. We do anticipate uh, Councillor Coleman and Councillor Johnson had both asked for an agenda item uh, for that for Monday. Um, there's probably some details that we need to address about what, uh, what the impact will be and what that looks like. We do anticipate that um, the people using water need to pay for the water that they're using. Um, it's a, a vital part of, it costs us a lot to generate that water. <laughs> and uh, so we, we do anticipate uh, that that's an, an important part of this discussion. But as far as cutting it off uh, for non-payment, um, I think there, there will be an agenda item for Monday to deal with that. Um, staff recommendation is to, to cease cutoffs uh, while there's a public health emergency. Um, open up the floor for questions or discussion related to that, and I want to thank Councillor Coleman and Councillor Johnson for bringing that forward um, for, for us to consider as well. Ms. Miller, will we recognize? Yes. Yes, Ms. Miller, uh, this right here, but now, I mean, when this first happened, this epidemic, epidemic people kind of didn't really take it for seriously. But we're serious now. But another thing is, is uh, I know there's a Zay Festival that has been canceled for the, the parade and all that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think myself, I don't know if we can do it by being on our grounds. That chili cook-off, it definitely needs to be canceled for all those people to be out there on that. So the chili cook-off's been postponed. Uh, they're looking for an additional later date. Are they? Okay, yes. I hadn't heard that, so that's the reason I brought it to your attention. Yes. Well, it's, uh, I, I was texting, I anticipated that question. I, I've been trying to find that out, and people, it's been a topic of discussion around town, and they, uh, they confirmed that for me today, that they are postponing. That's good. And floor back over you, Ms. Mayor. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, uh, just a couple of other things to uh, wrap up. Um, I do want to emphasize that we have taken this very seriously uh, at the city level, um, but at the end of the day, uh, this is a, uh, a national crisis, um, and, and the designee of who's the lead agency has been uh, the county health department and the state health department. Um, they, we're trying to help them as much as the, we can and do what we can as city leaders 
uh, to implement good public practice in the in our community but the role of the county health department is to develop these plans and to implement them we're that's why we're on a call with them twice a day uh, they get their leadership from the state health department they get their leadership from uh, the federal government um, so there's uh, as we look at how come we don't have tests in our community how come we don't have um, some of the resources we wish we had um, we look to the county health department and they're trying to help us solve those problems because that's their role in these situations one other thing I wanted to, to, to talk to you guys about just briefly um, uh, is that thanks to the Muskogee Medical Foundation and the county health department and the city and county emergency management we have a program every year called boo on the flu you guys are probably familiar with it it's uh, drive-through flu shots well what that also what that is is wonderful it's a drive drive-through flu shots for our community uh, free of charge but what that is is a pandemic preparation by our community for this exact sort of situation we have prepared and we are ready if we had tests today, we could do drive-through testing. We have worked with the county health department. We know how to do this. We practice it every year. If, we, if there were a vaccine, and hopefully someday soon there is, I'm not trying to put a timeline on that, but it, the day comes that there is, we have practiced for administering that on a mass level. And so uh, I want to emphasize to you that we are as prepared as we can be. We're relying on the resources that are available to us to impact our healthcare community. Um, with that, uh, I've concluded what I, what I was looking to say. Uh, be happy to answer any other questions, uh, and if not, we can uh, we can move on to the next agenda item. If this epidemic, I mean, this, this coronavirus got so worse, it's like other places where we have to stay in and stay home. Do you have a plan for that? Do we have a plan in place for that? And in, in a lot of cities, you know, if you get out, <coughs> they'll find you. You know. Certain amount of money. I think it was two. I seen on the news two fifty, two hundred fifty dollars to catch you out. Do we have a plan like that in place if something? I mean, if it just really gets worse bad here in Muskogee. So, so the level of authority uh, for that really lies with the state uh, for declaring um, who can restricting movement, closing down private businesses. Those are big constitutional sort of things. The United States Constitution provides protection for. Um, <coughs> freedom of assembly and freedom of, of movement. Um, and so when we get into those areas, um, those are decisions that will be, uh, that will be, we anticipate coming from uh, the state level, the federal level, um, or the county health department making recommendations. Um, if, if they say it needs to be decided on a city level and they recommend it, that will be your decision about what, uh, how those things happen if we have those sorts of things. So that, that is, that is how that would come about, and when, that, when and if that comes about, um, we will have plans in place, yes, to implement what is decided, to enforce um, what is decided. You know, again, God forbid it happens. Uh, uh, God forbid it does, uh, but that's not uh, something for our level of authority to, um, to initiate necessarily, but we will be able to implement and to enforce. We'd like to thank you for all you've doing, done so far because you've all you've kept us in knowledgeable of what everything is going on. So I commend you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And I think it's evidence that uh, we've been thrown into uncharted <coughs> waters through no fault of our own, and we can be very thankful for the caliber of employees and administration we have here in Muskogee. I, for one, am tickled to death with all of our employees. We have a great staff. So at, at different times, uh, private, uh, private um, health care providers uh, have that access to different tests, but they get sent um, 
when they administer the test, that's one thing. The, the second step is to um, apply the reagent, they call it. I'm not a scientist, so if, I'm not, if these words don't sound right coming out of my mouth, that's why. But uh, they basically evaluate the test, and there's a big logjam of evaluating tests. So the county health departments expressed to us their frustration is, number one, we don't have the tests we want to have. Number two, we have to, we can only give the tests we do have because they're so limited to a very small number of people. Um, and number three, when we do, there's a backlog on getting the results back because there's not um, enough testing uh, on, uh, on that result end uh, available. And, and they're just, the county health department is just as frustrated as we are. And uh, they told us, you know, last week, we'll have a lot of tests early next week, don't worry. And today they're like, we're, it's not happening. We're, they're, they're doing the best they can, so. And, and the challenging thing with that is not knowing the results, there's just more potential of contamination throughout our community. So we really have to do what we're doing tonight and follow these guidelines. Uh, unfortunately, this is one virus that does, does discriminate. <coughs> it does age discriminate. And uh, when you look at the statistics, it is very, very bad. Um, so I just, I really hope everybody follows the guidelines as much as they can uh, because uh, the mortality rate on this to, to older people is just not good at all. Have you been in contact with the hospital in, in case it really gets bad, bad, where people uh, really, really get sick, sick, sick? So we, we have indirectly and we do plan on being uh, in more direct contact. The health, we talk, like I said, we talk to the health department multiple times a day. Uh, and they are interacting with the hospitals. They usually say, here's what they're telling us. Here's what they're doing. So um, we, we haven't directly communicated with them. We are indirectly monitoring what they're doing. Um, and, and they're frustrated as well. They, they, don't, they can't test everybody, certainly, who wants a test. They probably can't test everybody who needs a test. How many beds does the hospital have? Oh, boy, that's a, that's a trivia question I wasn't 100% prepared for about, uh, about how many how many beds the, the uh, local hospital has. I'm, I think there, we I'm need sorry to, to say. I think we need to get to asking that question. <laughs> uh, yeah, th I, th I do think the limiting factor from what we've heard is the number of ventilators um, for people that have really bad symptoms and the number of staff that can take care of them, yes. So with that being said, I do want to say uh, thank you guys for what you said and definitely look behind me and, and to Tammy up who's in front of you. When you say the staff's doing a good job, it's these people back here that are working really hard and I stand in front of the microphone, but these guys are doing a tremendous job. They always do. And in times of crisis, they really step up and I'm very proud of our folks. So thank you guys um, and, and we're done for now. Okay. Is that <clears throat> end of item one we'll go to item two consider approval of resolution number 2801 declaring a local emergency under the Oklahoma Emergency Management Act of 2003 for the corporate limits of the city of Muskogee relating to the COVID-19 pandemic or take other necessary action mr. Miller again well, well, we're back. Hopefully, the, the discussion we've had previously illustrates some of the need for, for a state of emergency. You have before you uh, a declaration. Um, there's quite a few uh, elements to it. Uh, Mr. Tucker has been so kind as to draft it using um, his own vast knowledge as well as some templates uh, from other communities about what they're doing. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to him to let him talk you through it a little bit, and, uh, and then I think Mr. Evans will come back up and talk about elements of it as well. Good evening. All right. So uh, we provided uh, a copy of the draft resolution 2801, uh, which should be in your packet, and this is what is proposed. Uh, of course, uh, if there's something that you want included, we can certainly change that. Um, and so uh, what we did is uh, in the recitals, which are the uh, beginning portions of the uh, resolution, we've indicated the uh, different iterations of uh, declarations that were made. First, uh, with the uh, uh, CDC, the World Health Organization, and the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, the President and the Governor, all declaring emergencies. Um, certainly, uh, that those decisions have an impact on whether or not you uh, want to make the decision to declare an emergency. And so, um, uh, 
Additionally, uh, what this does at its very most basic level, uh, when an emergency is declared, it has to do with financial implications. So one of the things that relates to this declaration is a suspension of the city's purchasing procedures as it relates to um, acquiring necessary goods in relation to dealing with the emergency, which is dealing with the COVID-19 virus. So that includes uh, purchasing necessary uh, personal protective equipment for our first responders. Uh, that includes uh, finding additional uh, dollars for uh, public works to uh, pay overtime um, or to acquire any necessary equipment that they need um, to continue the work that they're doing. Um, as you know, with the uh, uh, recent declaration of emergency we did for the Memorial Day flood, um, we suspended the purchasing procedures for a period of 48 hours and then kept coming back and kept coming back to uh, renew that um, suspension. So what we're proposing this time, because we think this will be a uh, much longer process, is uh, suspending the purchasing procedures until April 27th. And so that will be on a regular council meeting. And so if on April 27th, uh, we have a need to uh, continue to suspend those policies, to continue the declared emergency, then we will have a regularly scheduled meeting to do that. Uh, additionally, uh, what this does is it will uh, authorize the city manager uh, to direct and establish reasonable prohibitions on public <coughs> gatherings, uh, city-owned and operated city facilities, um, and it will um, uh, ratify all prior acts. So um, as you know, the city manager is the uh, chief administrative officer of the city and handles the day-to-day -day operations and handles a lot of things uh, between council meetings. And so there are some things such as dealing with public health emergencies that he has to do immediately. And then we bring back to the council at a regular scheduled meeting. And so one of those is closing public facilities and canceling programming. Uh, and so this resolution will do that. Uh, additionally, uh, as Mr. Miller said, uh, this resolution does not mandate the closure of any restaurants, bars, or any businesses at all. Instead, it encourages compliance with all guidelines and recommendations that have been promulgated by the state of Oklahoma Health Department, um, the local health department, the CDC, and the World Health Organization. Uh, when we spoke with the uh, Department of Health uh, very recently on one of our calls, we very flatly asked them, uh, is it time for us to uh, make a declaration to close the restaurants and, and bars and things like that? And they told us that they were, they were at this time, um, only maintaining the recommendations made by the governor, which is to only make those recommendations voluntarily. So the businesses are suggested to close their dining rooms. They're suggested to maintain drive through options, curbside. Um, they are, uh, folks are recommended not to go to large crowded areas. Uh, the 10 person uh, limitation that we talked about, those are all voluntary recommendations. And so at this point, the local health department is maintaining that as a recommendation. And so that's what we're bringing forth from you tonight. Now, those can change at any time. And if they do, we certainly will be uh, ready to bring back an amended emergency declaration to enforce any more strict guidelines that are recommended by the health department uh, and for you to have the opportunity to make that decision uh, when that recommendation is made from them, if it is made by them. But at this point, we don't have that recommendation, so it's not included in the resolution. Uh, additionally, um, it provides the uh, city uh, and its employees with the ability to abate nuisances, particularly those that relate to uh, imminent threats to life, safety, and health. And at its very basic level, what this means is if we have something like a nursing home where you have a uh, group of folks who are quarantined inside and you've got someone who insists on gaining entry uh, to visit someone, then the police department can help. Um, the, these these uh, uh, declarations are not intended to be draconian. Uh, they are not intended to uh, bring the city into any type of militarized state, which I've seen on Facebook and other areas. Um, we are simply trying to protect the public <coughs> health. And in doing so, we are relying on the recommendations of those who know public health, and that's the uh, State Department of Health. Uh, and, and their subsidiary, the Muskogee County Department of Health. Now, um, 
as uh, Mr. Miller alluded, um, as he read one of the recommendations in response to uh, Mr. Councilor Van's question about uh, planning for um, worst case scenarios, there is a pandemic plan that has been adopted and was amended as, or was adopted as recently as October of 2019. Uh, and that establishes for the entire state, including communities, the what you do if plan. And that is where the guidelines, where uh, the cities, counties, and other school districts and whatnot work together with the county health department. And so to, to further answer your question, Mr. Van, uh, we are all continually in conversation uh, to do what's best for our community. Um, we're all looking forward to um, eradicating the spread and uh, we will do whatever is necessary uh, and legal to make that happen. And so is it possible that we'll come back to you in a couple weeks uh, with a request to amend this resolution to tighten it up, to make those recommendations uh, mandatory? Absolutely. But we don't have that recommendation from the health department yet. So that's not what is before you. So uh, with that, the last thing that will be uh, included in the uh, resolution is an adoption of amendments to the city's emergency operation plan. Uh, Tyler Evans is gonna talk to you a little bit about those amendments, uh, but while I have the microphone, I wanna talk to you about uh, one that was recently included that relates to uh, your positions as elected officials within the city of Muskogee. So in the uh, prior uh, emergency operations plan, which is periodically reviewed, uh, there is a provision relating to the continuity of government. So in any time there is a declared disaster, whether it be natural, uh, man-made, or an act of terrorism, there always has to be a plan for continuity of government. There always has to be a policymaker, someone or some group of people who are making decisions to continue governmental services. In this case, we're talking about continuing city services. And so, um, if the worst case were to happen and, and uh, a majority of you were to get ill, then we need to have a plan for continuing to operate, continuing to, to conduct business, and continuing to do our duties in the case that that happens. Now, the state of Oklahoma has uh, adopted uh, the, let me get the name right, the Emergency Interim Executive and Judicial Succession Act, which applies to state government, county government, and city government. So what we are proposing to amend the emergency operation plan to include is a provision within the uh, section relating to continuity of, go continuity of government, which will uh, require each one of you to appoint uh, no fewer than three, nor more than seven, emergency interim successors. And at its very, very basic level, what that means is in the event that you become unavailable after a declared emergency, now this is on a temporary basis, then you have uh, between one and seven people who you have indicated by order of succession a proxy to come and take action and exercise the duties of your office on your behalf until you then become available. So we're not talking about death, resignation, or removal because those provisions are already included in the charter. And so uh, under the charter, if a council member, uh, if a vacancy uh, becomes available due to death, resignation, or um, removal, then you all know this has happened before, you take action to vote and appoint someone to fill the vacancy until the next election. So that's always been in place. What we're talking about changing now is for temporary absences. So in the case that one or more of you were to be quarantined and wouldn't be available to come to a meeting or didn't feel well enough to uh, participate by phone, then one of the successors would be able to come in and act as a proxy on your behalf. And so um, the provision within the um, emergency operation plan would adopt those provisions. And so, as I mentioned, each one of you would uh, designate no less than three, no more than seven. And that designation would, made be, would be made by filing a letter with the city clerk. 
uh, indicating your uh, preferred successors and that it that they would be listed in order of your preference so um, Councillor Coleman if you were to become unavailable then you have three people listed we'd want you to we'd want you to list who you want first who you want second who you want third and so we would call that first person first if they're unavailable then we'd move to the second person call them and so on and so forth and so uh, once each of you have made that designation then the clerk will swear them in now um, that ensures that at the time they um, are enacted to uh, exercise the powers of your office they have already been sworn in get being having having been taken the oath of office and have nothing else left uh, for us to do other than sit in your spots and act on your behalf and so um, do they that, need to be residents of Muscogee? Yes, they they have to be the same. They have to have the same qualifications that you do to hold office. So, um, if you're a councilman in Ward Two, your emergency successors must live in Ward Two. If you're a councilman in Ward Four, same rules apply. For the position of mayor, since it's an at-large position, it could be someone who lives anywhere. Now, um, I want to uh, clarify that the term unavailable uh, is a term that is included in the statute, and it means that the lawful incumbent of the office is absent or unable to exercise the powers and discharge the duties of the office to which he or she was elected. And so, as we said, this does not mean a permanent unavailability. This is not death or resignation. This is if you're sick and unable to get here after a declared emergency. And so um, there is a provision also within the state law, which has been incorporated into the plan, that as soon as you become available again, then uh, their powers uh, are suspended. They no longer, you, you assume your powers as if you'd never left them. And um, once you file uh, your letter of three to seven individuals, uh, it can be changed at any time prior to them taking office. So, uh, Councillor Van, for example, if you had five people that you wish to name as emergency successors, and a month later you realize that one of them has uh, moved to Arizona, you can file another letter changing that order. So it can be changed at any time before you become unavailable and they and that first person sits in your role. And so um, this was incredibly necessary before the legislature passed Senate Bill 661 because you had to be here. Now with the amendments to the Open Meeting Act, it makes it a little more open and where this may not be as important for this particular pandemic. But these uh, revisions to the emergency operation plan are for all emergencies, not just the COVID-19 one that we're facing. So that's why we're making that change now. And so we're asking you to be thinking about your three to seven interim emergency successors uh, and to file that with the clerk uh, at your earliest availability, um, providing that you uh, approve the resolution and incorporate these changes to the plan. So uh, with that, that relates to the um, uh, continuity of government. Are there any questions? All right. Uh, with that, then uh, let me ask one other thing. Are there other questions relating to uh, the resolution? All right. If not, then I will turn the floor over to uh, Tyler Evans, our emergency management director, uh, so that he can go over the other uh, revisions, or excuse me, the other amendments to the emergency operation plan. Tyler? Good evening. So the emergency operations plan is something that we've always had. Uh, this isn't a new adoption of anything new. Title 63 of the Oklahoma State Statutes, which is the public health and safety statute, states that all jurisdictions of the state are required to develop an emergency management program. We have that. I'm the director of the emergency management department for the city of Muskogee. That statute also requires that, that we have a plan that addresses emergency management system functions and that plan shall be reviewed annually and submitted to the state. We do that yearly. This is nothing but a review and some additions that we need to change. Uh, this plan attempts to define who does what, when, where, and how in order to mitigate, prepare for, respond to, and recover from the effects of disasters and other major incidents. 
So the plan itself is about 173 pages. So I'm not going to flip through every page. I don't want to get off in the weeds, but I've highlighted about 10 different areas that we've changed, added to, revised to kind of bring it up to date. Uh, for example, the address of the Mercy Operations Center uh, was listed in the basement of City Hall. That is now over at the 911 Center on Court Street. That's been changed. Uh, updating the organizational uh, assignment roster, which lists the titles and positions of key personnel involved in the policy group or coordination group. Uh, since the last update, titles and people in these positions have changed. Uh, people retire, they've been promoted, uh, they take different jobs, so that's been updated to reflect our current uh, organization here at the city. Uh, updating the number of outdoor storm sirens and their locations to include the latest addition near Quick Trip and our new activation software we added last fall. That was revised in the plan. Uh, addressing the monthly testing of the outdoor storm sirens are now reads they will be tested on the first Saturday of every month. I believe it read it was on the first Monday of every month. Um, adding social media to the media section where we can update uh, our community through social media such as Facebook and Twitter. Addition of the organization responsibilities of health and medical departments, which was previously Annex H, which is now Annex G. Uh, additions also include what organizations are responsible for, let's say, mental health operations. That's now expounded on and listed in our emergency operations plan. Uh, expanding on the previous law enforcement and fire and rescue annexes that details exactly who is responsible for what and the roles and duties. Um, the damage assessment annex, which was previously Annex P, is now Annex L, and it details what forms to use and the duties and roles of the different organizations. And as Mr. Tucker previously mentioned, this plan also updates and adds to the continuity of government section uh, that was it expands on what we previously had. So this is not a new emergency operations plan. This is certainly revisions that we have to do that we're required to do by state statute every year and submit to the state. So as you know, COVID-19 was coming down and we've been working on this the past couple of months. We're starting to look in our emergency operations plan. This is a leaving, breathing document that we update annually. So these are just some of the revisions and additions that we've added to the plan. You guys have any questions? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Move for approval. Is there any further discussion? Anybody have questions or comments? Yes, I have one to Mr. Miller, Mr. Uh, Mayor Boston. Okay. If you can tomorrow, could you find out to, for me how many beds we have, how many respirators we have? And I know we're short on doctors, and I know we're short on uh, nurses, council and hips. So I have a <coughs> problem in this country. We're short, short, short on that department. But I'm just curious, you know, if it's, this thing does get really out of hand. What are we working with? Because I know we ain't gonna be able to go to Tulsa probably because they'd be full. And also the hospital out there, out there on uh, Main Street, St. Francis owns that, right? Yes. Okay, how many beds are out there? Are we uh, accessible to that? Also. Uh, I'll put that, both of those facilities on my list and try and get that to the, to the whole group. Now they don't, do they have nurses and doctors out there also? Because I'm not familiar with that out there. I'm not familiar with their, their full operations on that campus currently right now, to what extent they're utilizing that campus. Okay. I, I mean, if you can check on that also for me. I'll turn the floor back over to Ms. Mayor. Thank you, Thank Mr. Thank you Mayor. very much. Any other conversation? Roll call. Deputy Mayor Wayne Johnson. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Mayor Janie Boydston. Yes, and the motion carries. That concludes our agenda for this evening. Just want to tell everybody we're doing everything we can. Let's all use our head and uh, we'll get through this. Thank you. <laughs>